Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Modern Web Podcast. I am your host, Rob O'Sell. I'm a developer at This Dot Labs, and today we're going to be talking about Vue, Vue education, Vue community, and all things awesome related to Vue with uh, our, our guests here. Today we have Greg Pollock joining us from the Vue Mastery team, and also Adam Jar joining us from the Vue Mastery team. So how are you guys doing today? We're doing great. Yeah. Thanks for inviting us to be on the show. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming. So to get us all started on this, I thought it might be interesting to talk about kind of how you guys got into Vue and the Vue community. Because uh, one thing super interesting to me is I just got back from the All Things Open uh, conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, was talking to developers there. And you would not believe how many companies are using Vue in that area. And if that's representative in any way of developers across the country, I mean, Vue is taking off like a rocket. So i um, just kind of curious how you guys got involved in Vue and, you know, maybe what you did before. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I came from a company that I created a few couple years back called Code School, codeschool.com. And at Code School, we tried to be the place that people start learning like a bunch of different technologies. And I was always really curious what it would be like if we picked one technology and went really deep on that one and really had an impact in that particular ecosystem. So Adam and I, well, about a year and a half, two years ago, mm -hmm. went looking at different open source technologies that were still in the early adoption phase. It hadn't yet made it, made it to mainstream so that we could really have a big impact on that open source ecosystem. So we looked at a bunch of different technologies and really picked Vue based on a bunch of different factors, including like if there, how much education there was already out there. Oh, well, sorry about the doorbell. How much education was already out there and um and a bunch of other things and so we picked Vue and we just started creating you know we reached out to the Vue core team and started working with them to produce some really good videos including the Vue video you see on the front page when you go to Vue.js.org and so you know we've been diving into Vue and teaching Vue for about a year and a half now and just loving the community and really love producing it and one of the things that really has also kind of drove us to the Vue community and to teach this way is the way that we give back so on Vue Mastery, when you subscribe, we take 25% of every dollar that you give us. So that's every 25% of, of all revenue. And we donate that back to the Vue project itself to support its uh, development, to support Evan and all the great work that he's doing um, and make sure that the Vue community thrives. Um, and it's kind of fun that it's the underdog. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got you know, Facebook supporting React, you've got Google supporting Angular and Vue that's, you know, uh, those top three in the top three there definitely is kind of the underdog, which means it's really important that we find ways to support it. So as of last, uh, like, I think two months ago, like we're, we're giving about over $10,000 a month to the Vue project, mm -hmm. which is really exciting, really motivating that we can give back in that way to support the community that we teach. When's the last time you heard of a teacher getting to like help support the very thing they teach. I don't think that's very common. And so I think we both feel really lucky that we get to teach and support a technology we love. What do that's you think? really interesting. How about Adam, do you have any other uh, insights into how you personally got interested in Vue or is it basically did, 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 did Greg get it all? Right, yeah. So um, I came from a web, web development background as well and um, so when we were looking at different technologies, Vue definitely stood out to us. And there was, um, what Craig did mention, that there's an interesting synchronicity where we work out of his condo, which is the Vue, spelled V-U-E. So it seemed uh, almost preordained. So <laughs> We teach Vue at the Vue. Right. And it has a very nice view because we're on the 29th floor. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, this, the different metrics we were looking at, it just seemed like a good space to enter into. The community seemed very open and friendly and um, it's really proven to be uh, become a good decision that we had made. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, I really love this idea that you guys have of, of <laughs> connecting the interests of the educators to the developers of the technology, because I think in some spaces, uh, you know, sometimes there can be friction that builds up between those two parties, uh, between the maintainers and some of the educators. Uh, uh, and so I, I love that you guys are kind of combining the interests. Uh, in that way and kind of making it kind of a self-reinforcing ecosystem. I think that's yeah. probably extremely healthy for Vue, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. 
Yeah, I think we've now given the project over $150,000, somewhere around that. Yep, sounds right. Awesome. Okay, so now you guys have been in Vue, been in the Vue community for a while now, and I've certainly seen a lot of things and seen the technology change a lot. I'm just kind of curious, just on a general perspective, you know, what interests you in Vue, both maybe immediately and in the future? You know, what has you excited either about just the community or the technology itself, you know, as we continue, finish out 2019, go into 2020? Yeah, I think kind of the most um, immediate thing we're excited about is uh, Vue 3, which is which we're on the precipice of and um, have been able to kind of dive into the um, the new composition API, which um, Greg can speak more about because he's been working on educational content specifically about that. But I think really just um, in general, I'm excited to continue to see the community grow. Every conference that uh, we go to, it seems like more people are attending and um, more companies are sending their developers to either start learning it um, because they want to use it or they're already using it at their company. So just, it's cool seeing it, um, how much it's grown just over the past, um, you know, two years since we started dabbling and, and, and um, getting into the community, it's really expanded. Yeah, and one of the things I really love about um, Vue and continue to love to see in the, development of it is really how important it is to the people on the core team that it, that it stay accessible to beginners, right? Because I've seen this, you know, I saw this in the Rails community as it evolved from like Rails 2 to Rails 3, things got even more complex as the developers on it became more advanced users and they added more advanced features They kind of left behind some of the beginners and left behind how important it is for the um, technology itself to be accessible, to be easy to get started learning. And I love how much, you know, Evan Yu, uh, can, he comes from a design background, so I know that's important to him, and as well as Chris Fritz, who's like one of the best like documentation open source guys probably in the world, and um, how much he cares about exactly that too, making things accessible, being very opinionated when it comes to creating good documentation. And that's one of the reasons I think we see Vue continue to grow is because it has some people that really care about keeping it accessible to beginners. Um, and, you know, even with uh, Vue 3 coming up and coming out, I'm really excited about that. I've been diving into that, learning how to teach it, learning about, um, you know, why some of the new features in, are in there. And I'm really excited about the future. Um, Evan really um, did a huge, um, did a huge almost like rewrite um, all in TypeScript and fixed a lot of things and improved a lot of the technology that's inside of it um, in ways that are going to keep Vue really scalable um, into the future. Also as a side note, some people when they hear TypeScript, if they don't use it or don't wanna use it kind of you know, reel back, but just know that the source code is written in TypeScript, but you don't have to use it. Um, you can just use your regular Vue JavaScript, but the Vue 3, um, the way it's written will make using TypeScript that much easier within Vue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess because it isn't released yet, it, it isn't really something that uh, too many people can have strong opinions on. I mean, I guess some people might be using it in their existing code bases, but you know, looking forward to Vue 3 and beyond, do, do you guys think that that's a way that you will suggest people to learn it or that you guys will teach it? Um, TypeScript seems to be it took off this year, <laughs> really did. It seemed, seemed to capture so much of the minds of so many different teams. Um, do you think that really is the future of writing view or do you kind of just see it as like a nice, nice to have on the side? Well, as far as TypeScript is concerned, um, you know, I am seeing more and more uh, Vue developers um, pick it up, not the beginners. I mean, it's fine to stick with JavaScript, nothing wrong with sticking with JavaScript. And it's, um, but uh, I'm, I am talking to more of the advanced developers on bigger teams that are adopting it together. And once they've adopted it, they, they start to really like it. Some of the um, additional features it gives you inside of particularly your development environment to help you write cleaner code and more maintainable code and um, avoid bugs in the future. So why not pick it up? And the nice thing about that is that, you know, when you're picking up TypeScript, you're just, you're just basically writing JavaScript with a few, few additional features, depending on how much you dive into it, you know, and how hardcore your team is about creating um, type declarations and whatnot. Um, 
But you know, the way you started your question about view three and people picking it up. So right now, the state that we're in is just what? About two weeks ago, Evan, for the first time, um, publicly released the alpha source code for what he's working on, the code base he's working on daily. Um, and you can, you, know, you can take a look at it now. You can take a look through the source code. You can potentially do pull requests if you, think, think, if you find things that you want to fix or add. Um, just the other day, I downloaded it and I was trying to get it um, built and running. <laughs> it's still, you know, it's still alpha, so it still has a way to go. Um, you can't yet run it with view loader, which means you can't run it with the view CLI with dot view files, if you know what those are. Um, but it's getting closer to that point as we get into, you know, a, an official alpha and like uh, beta stages. I'm sure there'll be a big call from the core team to try it out on your existing projects to make sure it's feature complete and everything is working as expected. That being said, the biggest feature in Vue 3 right now is something called the Composition API. And basically, one of the big problems with Vue 2 that everyone ran into is that with the way that you code out components, right now when you organize your code and components, you break things out into options. You have your reactive data, stuff, data in the data option, you have methods, you have computer properties, you have lifecycle methods. And what happens when you have really big components is that your, your, your features inside those components get organized by the option, which means you end up with feature code that's scattered through a single file. Let's say you have a component that has three features in it and it, all the code is scattered amongst all the different options, which can get kind of feel sloppy and it makes it less maintainable because in order to adjust a feature, you have to look for its code in all the different parts. It gets difficult. And I've talked to lots of people that have run into this with bigger view applications. So that's one of the reasons that this new way of writing components is getting introduced. And it should be said, this is like a, the, component, the composition API is, an, is a new advanced way to write components and it's completely optional, but it's exactly for these users that are in bigger applications where they want to have a better kind of software design pattern for writing their components. And so it helps, it allows you to write your components by feature. The second thing is it gives you another way to reuse code across your components. You know, currently in Vue, we have mix-ins, we have, um, you know, plugins, we have, what are the way, we have scope slots, lots of different ways to reuse your code. None of them which are perfect. Um, they all have their downsides. And so this again is addressing that concern. Um, and the other concern, the other thing that's making it easier for is to write your components in TypeScript. If you want to do more TypeScript, this composition API is even more friendly with that. And so the cool part about this new API is that you can start using it right now in your Vue 2 applications if you want to start playing with it. Um, if you search, if you Google for like Vue 3 composition API plugin, you'll find a plugin that you can install in your Vue 2 app and you can start using it right now. Um, just uh, two weeks ago, I was in Vue London and um, I asked the audience, is anybody using the Composition API in their production applications? <laughs> and of course, the only people who raised their hands were the like three core team members who were sitting in the front row. Right. Go figure. So those guys are using it in production. That doesn't mean you should. But if you've got a side project and you're, you know, an intermediate to advanced view developer and you want to start getting familiar with this new syntax and thinking about how it might, how you might use it in the architecture of future applications, I highly recommend giving it a try. Um, it'll really start to give you, you know, change, start get you thinking about Vue 3 in new ways. And I should mention, last bit here, is that um, at Vue Mastery, what we did when this started getting solidified is we created a Vue 3 uh, composition API cheat sheet, which you can download free on our website. Um, and I've been also working on a Vue 3 comp, you know, course where I'm covering and explaining the why of this composition API, because admittedly, since it is a more advanced syntax, it can be a little more difficult to pick up than the normal syntax. But um, so I've started teaching on that over at Vue Mastery. And the first two lessons over there are free if you want to give it a try. Um, and, you know, and the last thing I want to say is about 
um, beginners, because that's where we started this conversation. Um, the majority of people starting Vue are still going to be using the normal um, options API for building components. That's what I think the great majority of people are going to be doing because it's so easy and it's so accessible for beginners. This new advanced API is really for kind of more intermediate advanced developers who already have the basics down. They're already familiar with the options API and they want a more advanced way to write components that allows them to write in a more maintainable and scalable way for bigger applications and scene. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's, it's like something you need if you need it, <laughs> meaning if you're not running into or expect to run into the issues that Greg addressed in terms of code reuse and the maintainability of these large components, then it's something that maybe you can put on your back burner. Um, but if that is something that if you want to kind of get ahead of the um, you know, get ahead, maybe even be one of the first people on your team to start knowing how to use Vue 3, then um, I would suggest starting to learn it. And we have produced um, some quality learning materials around getting started. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, it's interesting because obviously the, the hooks, the compositional API piece has stolen a lot of the air, a lot of the air time about Vue 3. Obviously there was sort of a the issue when the, the the sort of the request for for comment was was sent out and kind of just the passion from the community and honestly it wasn't just constrained to view when this happened with react there was a lot of concern about what this was doing to existing projects so you know what are you guys' opinions on people that might be say afraid of or just sort of resistant to upgrading to view three because they feel like they have to learn relearn everything from scratch that they have to migrate their entire code base that they might as well just stay on to because they don't want to go through all that effort. You know, what, what might you guys say to that, uh, to the people that are sort of have those concerns? Well, your U2 application, like, is not going to change when you start running it on Vue 3. The majority of the changes are all internal. The code base is a lot more modular. It makes it a lot easier for especially people writing extensions and plugins to the technology. They now have a way to write them in a way that's even more um, effective and less uh, and then more maintainable. So, I, you know, I, the majority of your code, you know, we're not changing the way you write view apps at all in view three. Um, it's going to be, you're going to write apps, apps in the same way. So there's not much to be afraid of. That being said, with the way they released that first RFC, um, if you're following that, there was just some bad verbiage in there. It wasn't that the problem is they didn't make it really clear that um, the majority of people are still going to be using the default uh, you know, component building syntax, and that's going to still be there, and it's important that it's still there. Um, the initial RFC made it sound like this is the new way, or at least the way people perceive it is, this is the new way to build components, which wasn't the case at all. Um, you know, this is a new advanced syntax, which, you know, beginners shouldn't, probably shouldn't use because they should be using the easiest, you know, using the easiest path to getting started, which is the existing way of writing your component parts in options. Yeah, and um, as Greg mentioned, it is more modular. So your bundle size can um, be smaller, even if you're not really diving too deeply into the new syntax, you yeah. can still make it more um, kind of tree shakeable, meaning like importing the aspects of the library that you use and keep away the parts that you don't. So um, yeah, so it's just yeah. a more lightweight um, option for you. Yeah, it's pretty cool how that works. Basically, yeah, if you're not using certain options in your code, when it gets bundled, it's not going to include that code. So it's going to only include the library code that you're actually using. And uh, you know, in order to do that, a lot of stuff had to be rewritten in a more modular way, which is what um, Evan did a lot of work on in Vue 3. Cool. So we talked about more performance optimizations, which is, which is always great to get for free uh, under the under the hood on a new release. Uh, mm -hmm. The TypeScript and the, the obviously the compositional API, or the hooks concept. Um, those have obviously gotten the most attention, certainly from all everything that I've seen about Vue three. Um, are there any other features that you guys have been playing around with or looking at that'll be coming with that library that maybe you guys are producing content for or people should get excited about? One thing that comes to mind, which I haven't yet seen any um, anything on, um, nothing has been released publicly that I'm aware of, is that Vuex will change. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically going to get a little simpler, I believe, in terms of um, 
the so basically how you use it there's going to be one last step um and uh i'm excited to start learning that and and ha see how it streamlines things and start teaching that um but i haven't yet seen anything published on that but i'm sure we, we will fairly soon yeah so a couple other things i can talk about um view three is making everything faster so that starts with a virtual dom rewrite so there's a lot of really uh, optimizations that evan has built into you know optimizing um optimizing how slots work doing static tree hoisting doing static prop hoisting doing um with the reactivity engine is now instead of using object defined property it's now using proxy based observation which comes with less drawbacks. There was certain, certainly some, some caveats to how using object-defined property, you had to be careful about how, for example, you were adding items to an array. Now you don't have to be so careful because proxy kind of works better when you're doing reactivity. Then also with Vue 3, it's about making it smaller. As we mentioned, it's tree shakeable. Um, when you're targeting native, because you know there's some great platforms where you can code Vue to create native apps, now with Vue 3, it's going to be platform agnostic. So it's even easier to use with any other platform, like if you're building an iOS app or an Android app. Um, also, um, it's making it easier to create more different software design patterns and even more uh, reusable code. For example, the Reactivity API can now be used independently of Vue which means it's going to be easier to test. It means you can modularize pieces of your application that you couldn't before, or even use the reactivity API and other applications that aren't even view, just using views reactivity engine. Um, and then obviously the, you know, we talked about this before it's the whole thing's going to have improved TypeScript support, which is becoming more and more important. Um, also, there's some really good debugging hooks that we didn't have before. I actually started looking at this yesterday, um, where there's some hooks because the, the issue when you are when you have a reactivity engine that is hooked into components and you have um, re-renders happening, you know, reactive piece of data changes and it triggers a bunch of re-renders on your DOM. Um, once you get into a really big application, you start running to issues where maybe the application isn't running as fast as you would like because you have a ton of components. So you need to start debugging, like what is causing this re-render or these series of components to re-render? And uh, you know, it's been historically kind of difficult, not impossible, but difficult to figure out and trace which, um, you know, which reactive objects are triggering rendering and what's getting re-rendered. And there's a bunch of cool hooks which are getting added next to kind of, if you can think of the V lifecycle methods, they kind of look like lifecycle methods, but there are things like, you know, they have the word triggered in it or, you know, render triggered and you can hook in and actually see what event is causing the re-rendering. So you can do some pretty advanced um, debugging, which gets me excited like uh, to see what the community creates when it comes to performance tools, because these hooks actually enable some uh, somebody to come along and write libraries or even create web applications that help you really diagnose where your view application is slow, which components are getting re-rendered constantly, and yeah, and which ones are the slowest. So you can really start optimizing your application when it's when it becomes important for you to create a really fast view application. That's really interesting. I, I think, I'm not gonna say it's underserved. I think I've seen a lot of announcements from the Angular team as well this year at Angular Connect. They were announcing a lot of uh, really cool um, instrumentation to help you really dig deeply into some of the internals of some of what's going on. And, you know, even besides that, I love seeing stuff like the uh, the view CLI UI or just the view UI basically that, that, that lets you kind of, yeah. or GUI, excuse me, the view GUI that lets you sort of scaffold a project, mess with it, run it, get diagnostic information about it all from just sort of one tool. And I just think that is going to be so huge to onboard mm -hmm. the next large chunk of developers, people that don't necessarily have command line proficiency now, or might not have ever opened the performance tab in their, in their Chrome console or know how to navigate through it, uh, to bring a lot of that in and kind of optimize that experience will be a, a big part of making things work better and hopefully work faster for, for end users. 
Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, UCLA already does have some um, performance uh, metrics that you can see right, right there in the CLI on any application that was that you created with the UCLI. Awesome. So, um, you know, with any time that a big framework announces a, a big release, a major release, there's obviously people that are questioning, you know, what, what should they do? So we talked about the people that are maybe Vue 2 and they're deciding how to approach Vue 3. But how about people that are just deciding to wade into the Vue ecosystem now, right? They're just, they're sizing up a migration or a, or a greenfield application. Um, is, it, is it right to start with Vue 2 now? Should those yes. people wait and, and do no. Vue 3? Should they do Vue 3 beta? No. <laughs> I think I've already got my answer, but do you want to clarify for them? Maybe tell them what you would advise people to do that are sort of just getting in? Yeah, I mean, Vue 3 is, I mean, Vue 2 right now, you know, is really stable. There's a lot of really great open source resources for it that are out there and working. There's a lot of great Vue 2 applications in production. So I think you should, if you're charging in a Vue right now, don't wait for Vue 3, just go ahead and learn Vue 2 with the resources that are out there and three comes out, which isn't going to be until, you know, sometime early next year, Q1, Q2, when it finally that the documentation team is already thinking, you know, about how we're going to make it really easy for people to migrate from Vue 2 to Vue 3 without much of a headache. So by the time it's ready and by the time it's out there, you're going to have a, a migration document and even a migration tool probably that'll make it super simple to do the upgrade. And like I said, um, you know, the, the, there's no big syntax change, right? It's not like you're going to end up rewriting your application. Your application is just going to work in Vue 3, except now it's going to be more performant and scalable, and you're going to have more options about how to um, extend it with the new syntax. Awesome. Okay. Well, listen, I'd love to pivot a little bit, talk about kind of some of the education stuff, because this is really interesting to me. You both are very uh, involved and have been throughout your career is involved in sort of code instruction, code education, training materials, and things like that. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people would find really interesting as well. So I'm just sort of curious, what attracted each of you to education? Like, what is it about teaching people about code and teaching people how to code that gets you excited as, as something that you've sort of centered your careers around? Well, for me, um, you know, I first found blogging and when I would produce a blog post, man, I would, I would go all out because I wanted to seem smart. <laughs> <laughs> and then people would come out of the woodwork when I started blogging. The first blog was uh, Rails Envy, railsenvy.com. And uh, people would come out of the woodwork and they'd say, Greg, your blog post was amazing. It really helped me out. And I would go, oh, they think I'm smart. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is all, I'm gonna do this again. And so honestly, what attracted me to teaching was really that quick, tight feedback loop of, uh, of getting that positive feedback that, that, I, that I could hear something I could do really well. And I also, you know, I, it was always clear to me when I would see um, other teachers teaching things, I, I, for some reason, I could always figure out, I could look at maybe three different ways people taught something and then figure out how to teach it in a more understandable way. And I really enjoy breaking down complex topics in a way anyone can understand and helping people in that way. Yeah. Um, for me, I come from an in-person code school background. So kind of starting as um, the person who served as a coach to people um, who may be coming from any industry, whether it's um, the service industry or being a truck driver and, and taking someone from really like a ground zero and getting them to a point where they can get a job and really transition their career and, and really augment their life by learning to code. So that's kind of where my background Come. So I find code education super valuable and fulfilling because I know and have seen how it can really change lives, how it can change families and really like extend to ch changing um, generations. Um, so that really inspires me and to piggyback off of what Greg said, just teaching things in a way where I 
know that I can help facilitate that those aha moments, those kind of mental clicks to happen, that's super validating to me and, and uh, really inspires me. And thinking of new ways to take these really abstract uh, concepts and make them concrete in the way that we do at View Mastery is very visual. We use a lot of animations to make these abstract concepts into something that you can see and watch happen in front of you. So you really have a firmer grasp on that. And um, yeah, so I think we have, I think it boils down to, we find teaching very fun and it's very gratifying to us. And uh, that's what makes us continue to do it. I love that. You know, I, I, we work a lot with junior developers and people that are coming into this industry and um, you know, I think that's been the biggest thing that I've seen change over my career is the amount of people that are entering development now as a second career, um, that they're transitioning into this and they're coming in as self-taught as out of boot camps or, you know, some of them going back to college for a second degree or, or something along those lines. And the paths now to get into development are so varied. Now, obviously, besides view mastery, which would be probably your guys' number one suggestion, and a lot of times people are just kind of curious, what should I be doing to start learning to code or to start getting into this industry. Um, are there certain teams when you talk to people like this, certain advice that you give, or, or do you guys have thoughts um, on what people sort of coming into coding that are listening to this and just like think, wow, Vue sounds really cool. Um, should I be learning Vue or should I be learning something else? Or should I go to a boot camp? Should I only teach myself? Should I go to college? I mean, do you guys have opinions on this or advice that you give to people? Well, if you can't, if you can afford a boot camp, you should always go to a boot camp. If you're just getting started, I think that's. Um, I wish the boot camp boot camps would have been around. Um, I was a few years too early, but man, you know, getting a computer engineering degree, graduating college with all of this theory and very little real world experience, <laughs> like um, if boot camps would have been around when I graduated college, I would have went straight to a boot camp. Um, and to really gain the skills that I needed to start building stuff and getting the jobs, kind of jobs I wanted to get. Um, so I think they're really doing everybody a service, people who are changing careers and also people coming out of college that um, they want to get more hands-on experience and learn some modern tools that they can use in the jobs that they want. Um, so that being said, what else would you add for people just getting into it? I, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say boot camps as well are huge. Um, in, in terms of getting into it, um, figure out what kind of learner you are and push into that. Meaning, are you someone who learns from video? Or do you learn better by having an in-person mentor, find someone in your, in your community, find a Slack group, um, find what works for you and, and um, really optimize that. Um, for me, it's visual. For me, it's video. Um, so I spend a lot of time on YouTube whenever I'm learning either stuff based on web development or my other interests. Um, and yeah, so um, there's probably teachers that you really resonate with more than others. So seek those out and um, kind of keep beating the drum of work, what works for you and, and you'll, um, you'll build up your skills gradually. And also just like confidence and, and belief in yourself that you can do it, you can learn, you can push past those, um, those barriers that uh, sometimes feel insurmountable, but uh, kind of just holding your hand through the process and, and, and encouraging yourself to push through those, that discomfort because there's a lot of potential uh, on the other side for you to be really validated in the work that you do and um, really grow the, the life that you have. I love that. I, you know, I, I like the idea too of different learning styles. I mean, I, I encountered that in my past too. I, I met somebody that hated going to school in, in college. He said the only reason he did it is because the paper was important, but he learned much more if he would just get the textbooks and he'd read it himself and synthesize it himself. And I do a lot more through visual. And I know some people, if they just have to build test apps, they just build side project after side project after side project. And I think especially if you're on, very active on Twitter, you have to be really careful sometimes about the inputs that you're taking in, the, the advice you're taking in, because sometimes certain communities and industries will trend towards people of a certain type. And uh, so they'll learn a certain way. And that's part of the reason why they're creators. That's part of why they rise up through the ranks. So the ways that they learn may not necessarily apply to you. And that's totally fine. Uh, I, I, that's why I like that there's such a variety of different ways now from super formal education. Uh, like I myself, I went back for a master's degree in software engineering because that's just, I love that. 
other people just building sample apps, other people, the immense amount of video content that's out there, uh, definitely. Cool. Um, so, you know, one thing that's interesting is I guess some, a lot of people uh, look at this educational content that's being produced and um, that I, they feel either two emotions. One is they feel like, I feel like I could do that, or they feel like I could never do that. Um, I don't know if you guys can demystify a little bit some of the process of how you produce content, how you maybe plan for it, uh, maybe how much time it takes after the fact to edit it. I mean, like, what should people know if they're interested in, you know, how the, you know, how it gets made? <laughs> how it gets made. Yeah, we're laughing because our process is um, a lot of steps and a lot of hours. But I would say the first first thing to know is there's different levels to I guess um, the depth into which you want to go and the tools that you want to use. And um, the important part is to just start doing it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and to kind of figure out what is your style and what is the kind of, I guess, MVP of like what you need to know and the tools you need to use. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I would say in terms of high level, it's, it's about creating quality screencasts so people can follow along with, the code that you're explaining and not assuming anything unless unless you've you know like clarified what assumptions you're making at the front and maybe you're referencing some prerequisite video or, or something that they can check out but not making any assumptions about their knowledge level and really um, walking them through step by step um, in the simplest way you possibly can phrase things mm -hmm. yeah yeah, a lot of people, a lot of developers, you know, we're very methodical. We like to solve problems in complex ways. And there's just a lot to be said for just starting to do it. Don't overthink it. You don't need a microphone, professional microphone. You don't need a professional camera. You can just go on YouTube, you know, and, you know, start creating videos. Um, and, you know, as you go along, you'll figure out, okay, this worked. This was hard to understand. You can ask your community for feedback. But these days, you know, anybody can publish this stuff. And there's always a lack of content when it comes to development, right? So, I mean, I talk to a lot of people, too, that say, oh, there's so many people that are teaching programming online. I don't know if I want to do this because it's already very crowded space. And I always look at them and I'm like, dude, it's empty. It's empty. There is always going to be a lack of good educational content in the developer space. There's always opportunities to teach new things and teach them in different ways. Um, so don't ever think that there's enough because there will never be enough when it comes to this sort of discipline. Yeah, yeah that's great. Even, even, oh, if there's, cool. even if there's several teachers teaching on the same subject, your way of teaching and way of explaining is going to inherently be different than those other people. So you might be resonating with learners in a way that those other people aren't. Yeah, and when you're learning a craft, you don't learn from just one book and then you know the discipline. You learn it multiple times from different people before it becomes your common knowledge. So yeah, don't be afraid of creating the same content that somebody else is creating because you're gonna have people that watch both content and learn from both places. Um, yeah. That's great. You know, and honestly, the same feedback goes, we hear a lot from people, I tell people when they're starting out with their career is to go speak at a meetup or if they're lucky enough or fortunate enough to speak at a conference. And I get a lot back, like, I don't know enough to speak at a conference. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Every year, a brand new set of people come into to the industry. They want to hear those same talks, but the people that gave them last year are now giving different talks. So they need yeah. you to step up and take yeah. that, give that talk to make that content. Um, you, can, you always forget, you, you think everything ends with you and comes up with you, but there's new people flooding into the industry all the time. So there's an, an, an ever per, a new demand for content at every level of, of, of knowledge. So for sure. Yeah, totally. It's also a great opportunity to deepen your knowledge about a subject. If you know that there's a conference you really want to speak at and you really are interested in this topic and have gotten started with it, um, dive into it and teach on it and, and, and share what your learning experience was like, share the gotchas that you came across. Um, your major takeaways, and that's totally valid as well. Do you guys have any advice for people that are passionate about um, educational content on the merits of self-publishing versus 
partnership versus, you know, uh, uh, whatever else, you know, you know, you guys have kind of started your own thing with view mastery, you know, some people uh, produce their own and sell it on their own website. Some people maybe partner with other groups like front end masters or any a number of other organizations that exist out there. Do you guys have any advice for people on how they should think about how to navigate that? Are there certain reasons why they might choose one path or another? Yeah. It depends on how much you love sales and marketing. <laughs> yeah. So if you love sales and marketing and you're willing to spend half the time on your little startup or on your course that you're spending, you know, so you spend half your time on sales and marketing and half your time creating it. If you're willing to spend that and learn what you need to know to do sales and marketing effectively, then, then sure you can go your own route. And in the long run, you'll, you know, you won't be giving someone else a cut. On the other hand, if you don't like doing sales and marketing and you just want to produce the content, nothing wrong with that, but you're going to want to shop around to look at, you know, what sort of cut a different platform will give you. Like you might want to look at plural site. You can publish on plural site. You can publish on, on front end masters. You can publish on new egg. You can, you know, there's lots of other platforms out there that you can um, put your content on and they'll even help you with content and they're going to take a cut and they're going to, hopefully do the sales and marketing for you. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so the last sort of set of topics that I wanted to talk about is just Vue.js community in general, which I think has been, in my opinion, from the outside looking in, one of the coolest parts of Vue.js is just the kind of community that it's, it's developed. Um, I love the fact that Vue calls out their community partners and actually specifically lifts up people that are making a positive impact. Uh, notably, both of you are on that list. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I've also worked alongside a lot of people that are involved in projects like the View Vixens and things like that. So I don't know if you guys, uh, I guess, first of all, do you guys have anything to say about the Vue.js community, the people that you've met at the conferences, just sort of that element of the Vue ecosystem? Yeah, um, how would I describe it? Very excited people. They, they, when I go to conferences, people um, seem to really enjoy working with the technology and enjoy learning more about it. And um, they're really excited to, you know, see the core team members on stage and whatnot. So there's just a really nice, um, excited vibe whenever I'm in the community. And it just feels nice to be a part of a community that feels very cohesive and welcoming and um, like you mentioned the view vixens there's um, different initiatives for um, women and those who identify as such to enter into the community so um, i would say overall like the barrier to entry in multiple ways not just on a technical level um, is quite low in terms of just entering the community feeling like you can um, start using the technology and make connections and friends within it yeah, it's just really friendly. Everybody's mm -hmm. really inclusive. All the people that are kind of in the, on the core team and around the ecosystems are just so friendly. And so you can go to conference and make friends and everyone's accessible. That's great. Yeah, I mean, one thing is that some people, when they see people on Twitter or then the community, you know, well-known well -known people, they kind of feel like I can't talk to them. These people aren't on my level, right? It's like they're we joke a little bit about online celebrity, but to some degree it exists. Some people really do feel like some of these people are sort of a cut above. So, you know, I get the sense based on a bunch of you guys are saying that this attitude, this atmosphere doesn't really exist in the view community, but like, would you advise people to sort of reach out to these people in this community? You know, like how, can you speak a little bit to how not that way perhaps the view community is? <laughs> yeah, it's really not. Um, and, you know, I think <clears throat> when it comes to the, the tone of how the community feels, it really starts from the top. Like, so yeah, yeah. certainly all in our, you know, the people in the community look to the leaders. And so, you know, what I see when I look at the leaders of the community, the people are, that are speaking at every conference, like even Evan, you himself, you find these really intelligent, extremely humble people who are gonna give you their time if you ask for it. Awesome. And it uh, affects the rest of the community. So that's sort of the mm -hmm. vibe that you get when you hang out at a view conference or even hang out online. Yeah. So this is maybe a more philosophical question, but it's interesting because this came up in another conversation I had with somebody recently. But, you know, what do you feel about this trend of people sort of identifying with a technology as a community, right? Do you, 
Um, so what I'm saying by this is uh, on some level, we're developers and there's certain traits and cohesiveness about our identity that's related to us being developers. And then yet more for being web developers and yet more for being JavaScript developers and then view developers and view X users and things like that. You know, what do you think about that? Do you think that that is something that is that useful, that that's something that should be uh, valued and that, that it's worth like fostering and promoting that? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this idea of, you know, what it means to be a member of the view community versus a member of some other framework community or just the larger JavaScript community? Do you guys ever think about the differences, the ways that those identities uh, land on you? Yeah, so that kind of, I see like two sides to that coin, meaning it is great to feel like you belong to a community. That's just a, you know, a human instinct that we want to belong somewhere and feel welcome and feel validated within that community. And, and the view community certainly has that aspect. But I think on the flip side, there can be some unnecessary division between like, oh, I'm, I'm view, you're react or you're angular. And like, there, you know, becomes these philosophical wars about I'm using the better technology. And then it gets like, this hierarchy and it that that totally just becomes copied silly. react hooks right with yeah, your few just, three stuff like come on guys uh -huh. it's like all of that all that is just in my estimation just like noise like okay cool you love your technology i love mine we like you know our core team members learn from each other and this is a collective space that we're in and and uh yeah so so i think community is great division between the different javascript communities or or what have you is kind of silly. View three copied React, so it's obviously inferior. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like that's pointless, right? Uh -huh. It's totally pointless. <clears throat> like I, I want to be using a framework that steals all no, I shouldn't use the word steals. <laughs> Let's say borrows all the best ideas mm -hmm. from all of the other JavaScript frameworks. Like, isn't uh what is it? Uh was it mimicry? What's the word when you copy somebody? Mimicry is it, the best it's form, form of flattery. flattery. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I got back into web development right at the height of the framework wars. So um, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I saw all that fighting going on. And I think one thing that surprised me the most, especially working with this thought and doing some of these podcasts is the degree to which those core team members and the people that are kind of working on all these things do not see these divisions at all. They're all extremely friendly with each other. They share notes because the idea is to make technology better for people. They have different ideas on what to focus on, maybe with their individual frameworks. But like if, if one of them has a great idea, they want the other people to know it and they want their good ideas too. And they overall just want to make everybody better in equal measure. I, I've never seen that level of animosity or competition between most of these core team authors or the core teams in general, which has been a great part of this. Yeah, that's kind of fascinating now that I think about it. Like. Um... As a as a view developer, you look at people like Evan Yu and you go, wow, he is just like a genius developer. But what you don't account for is all of the other personality and intelligence and attributes that have helped him create the successful framework. Things like, you know, the ability to uh, delegate and the ability to work as a team and the ability for him to somebody to come to with an idea and him to go oh that sounds like a great idea you want to take it on and you know ability to trust other people and to um, be creative about you know beginners and making sure beginners are accessible and so having sort of that design thinking right like Evan comes from a design background so he's got this great design thinking that he applies to the way he codes and the way he um, onboards people um, and just those, that sort of like humble personality and that collaborative personality and having that mindset of that we're all going to work together and sort of starting from there and refusing to sort of let yourself fall into those pitfalls of us against them. Mm -hmm. And when somebody at the, you know, when somebody with an idea has that personality, they're just more likely to succeed and get more people on their team, which I think is what often happens with a lot of these frameworks, especially when they get started. Awesome. Well, great. So uh, that kind of brings us towards the end of our, our conversation here. You know, we covered a lot of topics, so I just thought maybe we could all just sort of give one last thought. If, if there was anything that we didn't cover along the way that you just kind of wanted to call attention to. 
Uh, and for me, it's just a call to action for people to, if you, if you are at all interested by this conversation or anything to do with VUE, we definitely recommend reaching out. Obviously, these two guys as being parts of the VUE.js uh, community partners, I'd probably recommend going down that list and following all of them on Twitter if you're interested, because you're going to bring a lot of positivity and, and creativity into your life by doing that. Uh, and the Vue.js Vue docs are some of the best in the industry. So it's never been a better time to get involved, uh, um, to have such great educational resources, community members, and documentation with an evolving supported library. Uh, it's, it's an exciting time to learn Vue. So if you've been waiting, uh, start now. How about, uh, Greg, do you have anything to, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, and you know, I, 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 I would love to, if you're getting started in Vue, or even if you're into Vue, you know, I love teaching this stuff, and we want to continue teaching this stuff, so we could certainly use your support over at viewmastery.com. Hopefully, we can provide you some value with some educational content, and like we mentioned at the beginning of this all, like 25% of it goes back to support Vue.js itself. So I think it's a worthwhile investment. And if you do hear this podcast and you do subscribe because of it, do me a favor and respond to that first automated email that you know says, thanks for being a subscriber. And let us know uh, what you thought of this podcast and what got you to subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. And on the note of podcasts, uh, what we didn't touch on is Greg and I, and with our colleague, uh, Ben Hong, produce a podcast. We were doing a weekly kind of wrap up of the latest news, but we're, we've transitioned it into now a monthly view look, news. Um, yeah. Uh, what did I say? You just didn't say view. Oh, view news. Yeah. Um, so we do now a monthly look back of kind of all the biggest stories and uh, maybe news events that have happened in the view community. So it's a good way of staying up to date and uh yeah if you're a podcaster and want to continue view podcasting check us out awesome well great thank you so much and uh that's it for us for today thank you everybody for listening to this modern web podcast on Vue.js and the community and education uh thank you to our our guests adam and greg for being here today uh, but as always, as always, the conversation does not stop here. Uh, you can continue uh, the conversation online and, and reach us out on places like Twitter. So you can find Adam on Twitter at Adam Jar. So that's A-D-A-M-J-A-H-R. And Greg, you can find on Twitter at Greg Pollock. So that's G-R-E-G-G-P-O-L-L-A-C-K. For me, you can find me online at RoboCell, so that's R-O-B-O-C-E-L-L. -L. For the podcast, you can find us online at moderndotweb.com or on Twitter at modern.web. So thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next time.